morning. If it feels like an icebox in here, it's because it was basically a sauna in here last time, and I'm the one that needs to stay upright for the rest of the morning, so I'm just going to make sure that happens. Oh, now we're reading Nehemiah 4. All right. So we're going to cover the entire chapter of Nehemiah 2 today. That's the wrong way to say that. Um, so I want to just jump right in, and let, let me start by praying. Lord, it is such a gift and a privilege to be together, and I'm so grateful for every person in this room. You've given us such a great family um, through your blood, and, and we just love each other, and I, I'm so grateful for, for the fellowship that we have. And so, Lord, I pray for each of us um, that we would be able to put aside the distractions of our life and just be able to focus here in this moment now. Um, help us, Lord, to, to hear from you. Help me to get out of the way and um, just use this time. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to read Nehemiah 2. And it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate, desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then the king said to me, What would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me for all the governors of the provinces beyond the river, so that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted to, uh, them to me, because the good hand of my God was on me. Then I came to the governor's of the provinces beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jeru Jerusalem, and there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. So I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on to the refuse gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates, which had, were consumed by fire. Then I passed on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up by night, at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. Then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had, as I, had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. Okay, so in Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah requests a report of the state of Jerusalem. And when he hears back about its, its ruined state, he enters into a state of mourning and weeping 
And then he begins to repent, and he offers this beautiful prayer to God on behalf of Israel and himself. And he begs God to remember his promises. Now, there's a, a, a couple verses in chapter 1 that I think are key um, and very significant for our passage today and really for the rest of the book of Nehemiah. And I think if we fail to understand these passages, then we're going to have a hard time understanding the rest of the book. And so I want us to look at verses 8 and 9 of chapter 1. It says, Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of, heaven, of the heavens, I will gather them from there, and I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Now, when he says, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, he is referring to the covenant that God established with Israel through Moses. And covenant is a very important aspect of the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, it's much of the foundation for Nehemiah's actions in chapter 1 and 2 and most of the rest of this book. Some of you may have a good understanding of what, covenant, what covenants are, or you may especially know the biblical covenants pretty well, but some of you may not. And so I want to spend a few moments going through uh, two things. What, what is a covenant just in general? And then secondly, what are the biblical covenants and how are they relevant to the passage that we're studying today? So first, a covenant is really just a binding agreement between two parties. Um, and the best example that we have in our, our modern culture is the marriage covenant. You have a single man and a single woman, and they enter into a binding relationship with one another. You promise or vow to each other unconditional love and faithfulness despite all, in spite of all circumstances. So you say things to each other, such as for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. And then you agree that the covenant will not be broken until death do us part. And that's uh, your typical uh, Protestant wedding vows. Now you can, people do transgress this covenant, and when they do, we have remedies available for them, and usually that means divorce. Now these stipulations are, are generally known, but they're not you don't go to a wedding ceremony and pronounce these stipulations under which you may or may not break the covenant. Um, you just generally know that those things are true and that they exist. In America, we have a weak understanding of covenant. Uh, we can break covenant, in particular the marriage covenant, for pretty much any reason. We have no-fault divorce. And so, instead of the covenant being this binding agent that holds the two parties together, regardless of their feelings or the circumstances in their life, we place ourselves over the covenant. And we say, if I feel like remaining committed to this agreement that I've made, then I will remain uh, a part of this covenant. But if I do not feel like it, then I will step out of this covenant and I will break it willingly. In a way, our word means very little when we place ourselves over the covenant in that manner. If you look at scripture, co covenant is, is how God enters into relationship with us. Uh, it, it's how he interacts with us. It's also the manner in which we learn about the character of God and what he expects of us as his holy people. And it's also how he, he intel, or explains to us how he intends to carry out his plans. And that can either be through us or despite us. Now, covenant is, is really uh, important, and, and, and God, in the, in the sense that God always holds to his word. So some of you may be familiar that in Genesis 15, 17, uh, it, God makes a covenant with Abraham, and when he does that, he um, solidifies the covenant by cutting an animal in half, and he walks between the two halves of the animal. And that was a common practice in that time when two parties would make an agreement. And what they're telling each other is this. 
as they walked through, both parties would walk between it, and they would be communicating to each other that so be it to me as it is to this animal if I break my agreement with you. So basically you're saying, I, am, I will die before I will break this agreement that I have made with you. What's interesting about the, the covenant that God makes with Abraham is he is the only one that passes through both halves of the animal. And the reason for that is he knows that he is the only one capable of holding to his word. He knows the heart of all men. Now, a typical covenant has several elements, but I want to point out the most important ones. There's a list there, but I'm only going to point out the most important ones. Uh, first, you have the parties involved in the covenant. And so for us, uh, you know, we in our legal contracts will spell out the parties that are involved in whatever contract that is about to, to be written. And then the, in, a, in a covenant, there's an understanding of the relationship. And so that's where you get the language, I will be your God and you will be my people. So there's an understanding that God is placing himself as, as, as our king, essentially, and we are his uh, followers or his servants. And then God uh, provides stipulations, and these are really just commands or boundaries for the relationship. And then there are remedies available, um, and <laughs> we really would call these curses and blessings. And those curses and blessings are, are dictated to us. We do not dictate curses or blessings to God, and we actually don't di dictate any stipulations to God either. In, in this relationship, God is dictating all of the stipulations and all of the curses and blessings because God is the one that will um, uphold his end of the bargain. So, in our passage, Nehemiah would have clearly understood the Old Testament, and he would have known about the covenants that God has, had established with his ancestors. And he would have been keenly aware that their exile, the nation of, Israel, of Israel's exile and his own personal exile, was the result of breaking the covenant. But he also would have been aware that God had provided a means for restoration, both to the land that he had promised them and into relationship with them. And those were spelled out in the covenants that he had established. And so today... I just want to walk through briefly a few of the covenants that God established that are Im important for our passage today because I think once we go through those, you will understand Nehemiah's actions in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and you're going to understand why Nehemiah is so confident or growing in confidence that the hand of God is upon the work that he sets out to do. So I'm going to run through a bunch of passages, and those are going to be on the screen so that you don't have to flip back and forth. The, the first covenant, there's, there's many covenants, but the first one that, that's important for our passage uh, today is the covenant that God establishes with Abraham. This is what he says in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, in that covenant, we find that God is promising that Abraham, from his line of descent, will come a great nation, and we find that God is going to provide a land for him to dwell and inhabit. In Genesis 13, 14 through 17, we see this. Uh, God says to Abram, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. So, again, God is promising to Abraham that he is going to provide a land, and he's spelling out the, the width and the breadth of this land. And then in Genesis 15, 5 through 6, he again affirms, and he says, Look toward the heaven and, the number of the, the, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. So shall your offspring, offspring be. So again, God is affirming that there will be a line of descent from Abraham, and, and it will be a great multitude. God reaffirms this covenant 
with the next two generations of Abraham's line. He, he does so with, with Isaac in Genesis 26, 2 through 5. And he says this to, to Isaac, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, in my law. So God is reaffirming to Isaac that he is establishing this covenant uh, and will fulfill his promises to Abraham. And he does the same thing with Jacob. In Genesis 28, 13, he says that, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you all and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for you, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. So, God with Abraham promises that they are going to have a line and that line is going to become a great nation and then they are going to inhabit a land. And that land is what we know uh, today as Israel. Now, when we get to Moses, the covenant begins to change a bit because now there is a a people and God desires for this people to be this, this, this holy people for himself. And so, if you notice in the Abrahamic covenant, it's unilateral. And what I mean by that is that God tells them, I am going to do this. And there is no, if you do this, then I will do this nature to the, to the covenant that he establishes. That, is, that changes with Moses. He begins to uh, pronounce the, this, this phrase, if you, then I will. And that's because he wants a holy people for himself. He wants this people to, to reflect his character to the world. So in Exodus 19, 3 through 6, God establishes a covenant that he later ratifies. And, and this is what he says. Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenants, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So, now we've had added to this promise with, through Abraham that we will have a, a land and we will have a, 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 a line, a descendant, a great nation. And now he's promising that if they remain obedient and follow God, that Israel will be a, a kingdom of priests and they will be a holy nation. They will be God's representatives to the world. Now, within uh, this, this, this covenant that he establish, establishes with Moses, he provides curses and blessings because of his desire to create this holy people. And so, there are a few curses and a few blessings that he pronounces in this covenant that are important for our passage, and we're going to walk through a few of those. In Leviticus 26, 33 through 35, God says, if they break the covenant, he will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. So that's the first uh, time where he tells them, "I I will send you into exile if you fail to uphold my commands. In Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 28, he says... After you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and arousing his anger, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see, which you cannot see or hear or eat or smell. And he affirms that again in Deuteronomy 28. He says, The Lord will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. 
So, if they transgress the covenant, God will send them into exile in this land that he intends for them to inhabit and inherit as their possession. He will, he will cast them out. And that is because God needs Israel to be a holy people if they are going to be his representatives to the world. And so, both for Israel and for the nations that, that look to Israel, this exile is a sign of God's judgment that they have transgressed his laws and failed to reflect his character to the world. But God also is gracious and merciful. And so he provides a means for them to return both into relationship with him and into the land that he has promised them. And so only a few verses down in both of the passages that I just read you in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we find the, the, the means by which they can return. First, in Leviticus 26, 40 through 45, we learn this. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. For the land will be deserted by them and it will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees. Yet, in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. And in Deuteronomy, he says, but if, there, if from there, from exile, you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. So the covenants are important because God when he promises something, he will fulfill that promise. And you can be sure that that will take place. God's perfectly trustworthy character is the foundation for any covenant that he establishes. And it is the source of our confident hope that those promises will be fulfilled. And so that is the basis for Nehemiah's uh, confidence in chapter 2. And it is why he begins the book in chapter 1 with repentance. Nehemiah is acutely aware that their exile and his personal exile is directly linked, linked to the disobedience of his people. It would have been a constant reminder of their transgression because they would have been well-educated in the law. But he also would have known the covenants and he would have known that God provided a means for them to return, and that that return began with a true repentance of the whole heart and the whole soul. And so that's why in chapter 1, he enters the state of weeping and mourning, and then offers this prayer of repentance, and he appeals to God's covenant promises, as we saw in verses 8 and 9. In, in verse 5, he declares that God is the one that preserves the covenant, because he knows that God is the one that is faithful to the, his word and is faithful to the promises. And so he is trustworthy in whatever he declares. He ends the chapter praying that he will succeed and the basis of, of that hope is that he is entering this state of repentance and that he desires to lead Israel back to the land that they were supposed to inherit and to lead the hearts of the people back into relationship with God. So he knows the character of God, that he is trustworthy and that, that he was merciful. And he knows that he desires for Israel to inhabit this land. But there's still a monumental task in front of him. And that's where we find ourselves in chapter 2. And so let's walk through chapter 2 together. In verses 1 and 2, Nehemiah is before the king in his official role as cupbearer. 
And clearly, he has been in relationship with the king, or he's been before the king before, because the, the king notices this state of sadness, that his disposition or his countenance is, is sad. And so he asks him, why are you sad? Because it doesn't appear that Nehemiah is sick. Now, this would naturally cause a lot of anxiety for Nehemiah and, and for you and I, frankly, because you are, begin to recognize this is, this is your moment to, to bring this request before the king. And you have no idea how the king is going to respond. This could be seen as an act of rebellion, and he could be really angry, or he could look on this with favor. I think that it would be important to point out that at this point, Nehemiah is still unsure about whether or not the hand of God will be upon this work, whether or not God will grant him the success that he seeks. This is, is the first step for Nehemiah in assessing whether or not God is going to grant him favor in bringing Israel back from Ezra, Ezra, exile. So a lot hinges on this request that he is about to make. He's, he's afraid, but he's stepping out in faith. And so he first responds with a customary greeting that shows loyalty to the king. He says, let the king live forever. And then he, he begins to explain the reason for this disposition because the, the country of his, his ancestors lies in ruins. Now, he's sad about the physical state, but more so, he's aware that the physical state of Jerusalem represents the judgment of God upon him and upon his nation and their rejection of God's laws. The king actually shows pity uh, because he, he asked Nehemiah what he's looking for. And, and Nehemiah responds by asking the king for permission to rebuild the walls of the city. Now, this is a bold question because a lot hinges on this. His response to this question will dictate whether or not the hand of God is upon this work that Nehemiah sets out to do. You'll notice it says that, that he prays when he makes this request. And obviously he's been in this long period of prayer, of mourning and weeping and seeking God. And then he's, he's been waiting, hoping for this moment to come before him. And so that prayer is, is a recognition that if this is going to succeed, he needs God to intervene, to give him that success. In verse 6, we learn that the king grants Nehemiah's request. And then in verse 7, we see uh, Nehemiah's faith or his confidence beginning to blossom um, that, that God's hand is actually upon this work. And the reason we know that is because he makes two requests. The first is he asks the king for papers to provide him safe passage uh, so that he can't be stopped by any of the local governing bodies as he makes his way to Judah. And then also, he asks the king for the resources that he needs it, to be able to rebuild the walls of this city. And this is when we reach a key point in the passage. We learn that, that the king grants the request, but then Nehemiah makes an important statement. He says the, the reason he understands that the king has granted this request is because the, the good hand of God is upon him and the work that he has set out to do. So now Nehemiah is clearly aware that God has his hand upon him and that his favor is upon the work that he intends to do. He's confident that God is with him. I think it, it's important to point out now that God is sovereign, and when he intends to carry out his plans or fulfill his promises, even the most powerful people, the kings or the rulers, really just become pawns in the whole plan that he sets out to achieve. So we, we see this progression in the passage. Uh, we begin with Nehemiah in, in front of the king, and he, he knows the king is this important piece to the plan that he's trying to carry out. And by verse 8, he recognizes that if God's hand is upon this work, then the king is really just a small obstacle to his success. So then we arrive at verses 9 and 10. And Nehemiah sets out onto the journey, and he arrives at the governors of the provinces beyond the river. So he's getting close now to Jerusalem. And we learn that not only did the king give him papers for safe passage, but he's given him an armed escort along the way. So Nehemiah's confidence is only growing greater that God's hand is really 
upon this work. And we learn about two particular governors in the area, Sanblat and Tobiah, and they are upset because someone is seeking the welfare of Israel. But we don't learn much else about this exchange because Nehemiah has been diligent in ensuring that he passes through and, and God's hand is upon it. And so he passes through without any conflict. So then the passage turns to verses 11 through 20 and, and we're in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah has, has not disclosed his plans about what he, like, he wants to do yet. Before he does that, he wants to make a, a complete assessment of the situation. But in verse 12, he makes a, an interesting s- statement. He says that he didn't want to tell anyone that what God was putting in his mind to do for Jerusalem. So from verse 2, we've moved from Nehemiah being in fear, and now we've moved to verse 12 where there's this blossoming confidence that this is actually God's idea that he is giving to Nehemiah. It's not just Nehemiah's idea that he's hoping to carry out. But he remains diligent and carries out his plan because if you've been here and, and gone through the book of Ezra a few months ago, you know that the kings and the rulers are often fickle and change their mind quickly. So he goes out by night and he begins to examine the status of the walls. And I have a photo of the walls at that time. This is, this is Jerusalem at the time of Nehemiah. Now, if you look into the northwest corner, you'll see uh, a little bit, a little, well, it's hard to describe it, uh, about halfway down, that's the valley gate. And that's where he exits. And it says that he works his way south along that wall to the, to the point at the end. And that whole hill to the, to the west of the wall is, is in ruins at this time period. So no one inhabits it, and it's, it's, it's lying in waste. So he works his way all the way down to the south, and when he gets to that point at the end, he, this is where, that's where he inspects the wall, and it says that they had been destroyed by fire. And then he works his way up to the east, and it says that he, um, his, there was a, his mount couldn't pass or his horse couldn't pass, so he works his way up the ravine. And so then at some point, he doesn't continue around. He actually turns back and works his way back around and and enters where he first came out. So that's a picture for you of of what he's actually doing as he's inspecting these walls. So at this point, Nehemiah has made a full assessment of the situation. First, he assessed the spiritual condition. And that's where he repents before God because he knows the covenants. And then he sets out and, and makes his request before the king, and the king grants his request. And so now he's growing with confidence that God is upon him and the work that he's setting out to do. And then he, he, um, he's assessed the physical reality. He's looked at the walls. He knows the task that is before him and the people of Israel in rebuilding the city. So he has the, the spiritual and the physical side both assessed. And he's ready to present to the leaders and the people of Israel his plan to restore Israel. And he carries with him the full assurance and confidence that God is upon the work that they are going to set out to do. In verse 17, he begins by addressing the leaders and the people of Israel. And he directly states the the state in which they find themselves and the seriousness of this situation And and then he immediately calls them to action because he has a plan in mind and he knows that God is with them. And he uh, makes an important comment that would serve as a source of motivation. He says that they should set about this work of rebuilding the wall so that they will no longer be a reproach or in some translations you'll hear disgrace. Now, this disgrace would would be based in the, the, the truth, the reality that the Israelites are to be this, this people of God. In fact, in the covenants, they're to be a special possession, a, a holy uh, nation. They're, they're supposed to be a kingdom of priests. And so their state of exile, uh, the ruined state of their city, is, is a disgrace. For them, it was a sign that God's judgment was resting upon them. They were the mockery and the scorn of other nations. And for them, they recognize that, that God intends for them to be this, this special possession and to possess this land. And so the disgrace is all based in that reality. Uh, Nehemiah can appeal 
to this reality because the people themselves would have known this to be true. They would have studied the law. And so when he appeals to this, in their minds, they immediately know, yes, this is true. That we, we are a disgrace amongst the nations. But they also would have known that, that God has provided a means for them to be restored. So Nehemiah sets about explaining to them the ways that God has had his hand upon him in the process that brings him to that moment where he's standing before them. And he's trying to, to uh, produce within them confidence that God is at work in restoring Israel. We're not told what he says, but for, we can uh, assume that he recounts his prayer of re- repentance because the covenants require that, that that be the place where they start. And then he would, would tell them about the way that, that he's gone before the king and that the king has granted this request. And not only that, he's given him safe passage and an armed escort and the resources that they need to build the wall. So the people would begin to blossom with confidence that the hand of God is, is both upon Nehemiah and he's upon this work that they're setting out to do to restore Israel to its former glory. And so they set out and they begin to do the work of rebuilding the walls. But Sanballat and Tobiah and another person, uh, Geshem, show up. And they're there to despise them and to mock them and to plant seeds of doubt about whether or not this work will actually succeed. Now, imagine that you are not Nehemiah. You're just someone that sets out to do this work of rebuilding the walls. You've lived in this ruined state for a while. You have been the scorn and the mockery of all the nations for for probably your whole life. You've been truly an oppressed minority, whether you lived in Jerusalem or you lived outside uh, in somewhere else in in the Persian Empire. Now imagine one of these neighboring uh, authorities, these governing bodies comes and they begin to mock the work that you're doing and they're They're questioning whether or not you can actually complete this task. And on top of that, they're planting a seed of doubt within you that you may actually be rebelling against the king in the work that you're doing. You, if you're not Nehemiah, have not been, uh, you you, you were not there when you prayed to repent before God, and you uh, were not before the king. You don't know how that interaction went. You don't know what the king has said. You only hear that secondhand. So your confidence may not be as strong. And their mockery and their, their seeds of doubt may actually uh, have an effect on you. And, and there's a possibility that they could stop you from doing the work that you're doing. But Nehemiah is confident because he began with repentance and he prayed for God's favor. And, and, and he uh, knows that God has provided the means and the resources for him to, to rebuild. He knows that God is inspiring this group of people to rebuild the wall with them. He has no doubt, Nehemiah does, that God's hand is upon the work. And so he replies that the God of heaven is going to give them success. He is confident that this work is directed by God and that because of this, they will work, they will be successful, and the governors will have no share in their inheritance or in their governing in the city of Jerusalem. I think that's an important point because what he's declaring in that is, we, Jerusalem, Israel, are to be a, a holy people. We are to be this special possession for God. And that includes how we govern ourselves. And so there's two things. There is the recognition that this is a land that they are to inherit and to possess. That is a God-given right that they possess. And second, when they inhabit that land, they are to be this shining beacon or a city on a hill. And so the way that they govern themselves has to be in accordance with God's laws. And therefore, those rulers have no share in their inheritance or in governing them any longer. So, we see a progression in this book, in this chapter, sorry. Uh, The soil really is laid in chapter 1 when Nehemiah begins to repent and he weeps and he prays before God. In Nehemiah chapter 2, we, we see Nehemiah begin to step out in faith. So he's prayed for God to grant him success, and now he begins to step out. But at the beginning, he's fearful. He's still wondering, is God going to be with me? Is God's hand upon this work? So he asks the king for permission to return and rebuild the walls, and he's given that. And not only that, he's given safe passage. He's given the resources he needs. And then 
he, he goes to Jerusalem and he, he assesses the state of the situation and, and he confidently stands before the leaders and the people of Israel and he declares to them that God is going to restore them and that they are going to, to do this work of rebuilding the wall. And the people grow with their confidence because they hear of the way that God has orchestrated these events. Now, we also see in this passage the importance of the covenants. God has declared that he uh, will establish for himself a people, a holy people, and they will inhabit a land. And so he provides laws and commandments for them to be this, this holy people, this special possession, this kingdom of priests, so that, that their character will reflect God's character. If they're going to do that, they have to, to, to live in such a way that reflects that accurately. But you and I know the story of the Old Testament, and really we know ourselves. And God knows that. He knows that we are incapable of keeping our end of the bargain, even when he is capable of doing it himself. And so that's why he puts these provisions, these curses and blessings in the covenant. And that's why he sends Israel into exile as he says he will. So when we, we arrive at the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is very aware that they have transgressed the covenant because they are in exile. And so he sets out to restore Israel both to its rightful land that God has given to them and he seeks to return the hearts of the nation of Israel to God so that they can be this holy representative. They can be uh, a kingdom of priests to the rest of the world. So, what does that mean for us? And we're running short on time, so I'm going to, to give you uh, the gist of, of that. Hopefully, you see a consistent theme in Scripture. You see it, it, uh, the same God in, in Genesis that you do all the way to Revelation, and you see the same God at work today. You see uh, God, the same God at work in the covenants. You see the same God at work in Nehemiah. You see the same God at work in prophesying this new covenant and Messiah, and then Jesus has come, and we live through the blood of Jesus in the midst of this new covenant, and that work continues today. And so we, as the church, are to be this holy people, this holy and special possession for God. We are God's representatives to the world. And so what I want to say is that we worship the exact same God that we've read about in every passage today. We worship the same God throughout history and time. He has not changed. And so I want us to see ourselves as a part of this larger story and see that we connect all the way back to Abraham. God is enacting and working a plan throughout history, and we are a part of that plan. We worship and obey the same holy God that Israel did, and we are to be the exact same holy people, the same special possession that God had in mind for them to be. We experience the same grace and mercy that God extended to Israel. We experience that grace and mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we place our trust in the exact same trustworthy God who will accomplish and carry out his plans. And we can be confident that he will do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what a great God you are. You are the same yesterday, today, you'll be the same tomorrow. And it's such a gift to know that, to see that at work in Scripture and see how, how gracious and merciful you have always been, to see how you've always desired us to be a, a holy people, to, to represent your character to the world. And so I pray, Lord, for us as the church, both individually and corporately, that we would be that holy people, that our character, our conduct, would reflect you to this world, that people would see us as this, this city on a hill, this this shining light. Lord, thank you for every person in here and, and be exalted, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen.